Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to do a few announcements before I introduce uh, Joanne. Uh, this is the inaugural uh, lecture for the 2019-2020 series, so we're really happy to have you here. Um, so just some events coming up. Thursday, November 21st is the World Hospice and Palliative Care Day, and we have a special lecture. Um, at the Bond Center for Information Technology, that's at 40 St. George at 6.30. It's going to be Diane Meyer, who's the director for the Center for Advanced Palliative Care, coming in to talk about palliative care and American medicine context. On Tuesday, November 26th, in this room, uh, we'll be having um, to our visiting professor, Tam Perry, who is an associate professor at Wayne State University, and she's going to be talking about health and housing concerns, aging research and community outreach, outreach in Detroit, Michigan. She just done a whole bunch of very interesting research, including around environmental toxins and its effect on older adults as well. Um, and on Thursday, December 5th, the title is Exit Music, the experience of music therapy within medical assistance in dying. And that'll be Sarah Rose Black, who's a PhD candidate and is working at Prince Margaret, Princess Margaret, as well as a PhD in the Faculty of Music. Um, and as always, we have our online workshops. Um, the next one coming up is going to be neuroscience, mindfulness, and uh, working with the elderly. Um, and that'll be November 4th for a start. That's my colleague, Rob McFadden, who's an Emeriti professor here and has been working in mindfulness for more than a decade. Um, and then we have uh, our ever popular end of life interventions for palliative individuals and their families with Corinne Smurl and Amanda Clark. And we have uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety disorders among older adults in February age-friendly uh, long-term care and communities in March, um, in evidence-based strategies for supporting family caregivers and older adults with dementia in, uh, again, late, late March, that the other one was early in March. And then in April, we've got developing confidence in LGBTQ affirming care. All right, so with no further ado, here we go. I'm delighted to introduce to you doctoral candidate Joanne Tay, who is in her fourth year of her program in nursing. She also works at Emily House and specializes in palliative care for children. The, t the topic of her um, talk today, who's, and it's also uh, her dissertation, is self-reported experiences in healthy siblings of children with life-threatening conditions. And her supervisor is Kim Widger, who's been a long time um, a support of our faculty. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Esme. And um, hi, everybody. So, so can you hear me? Is this good? Okay. okay. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. So um, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for coming here today, despite the rain. <laughs> um, so very quickly, I would just like to introduce um, a brief overview of uh, what I'll be covering today. Uh, first is what we, oh, thank you. So what we know about families and children living with life-threatening conditions, uh, what are the research and clinical focus to date, um, and we'll talk a little bit about my scoping review and the findings, and then leading up to my study objectives, implications, and summary. So before I proceed, I'd like to bring in an example here of what it means to a family who, have, uh, who, have a who had a child with life-threatening condition. So Cyan is a child diagnosed with a congenital heart defect at birth and eventually died from her condition 16 years later. So the, the two quotes that you can see on the slides here are reported by uh, Rebecca, who is Cyan's mother. She mentioned that when Cyan was still around, her care was, mo she was overly kind of occupied with Cyan's needs. And only after her death that she realized that she had missed out a big, parts of a, a big part of her son's life. And Rafi over here at the bottom, you can see he, uh, he, he is Cyan's brother. 
He mentioned that Cyan was supposed to die a week after her birth, but she ended up living a lot longer than expected. So such scenarios are actually not uncommon in families of children with life-threatening condition, and it clearly affects both the ill child and their families over time. So what's the definition of life-threatening condition in children? It is defined as conditions for which the possibility of death may occur before adulthood, curative treatments may be feasible but may fail, or that there's completely no treatment, no possible treatment, and that, that, uh, and that the affected child is expected to die. These conditions are often chronic and complex in nature, which significantly affects the lives of the family and the child themselves. So as the definition says, the says it all, the life-threatening condition in children is unique and in that it's complex, it's chronic, and it persists over a long time. Some of these conditions may be so rare and uncommon that families and children are unsure what's going to happen next. So, so over here, children's life-threatening condition can be broadly divided into four broad categories or what we call quadrants. And this model was that you see here was organ uh was um okay <laughs> Okay, so over here, um, children's life-threatening condition can be broadly divided into four broad quadrants or categories. And this model was actually put together by the a British charity so, uh, called Association for Children's Palliative Care. So these four quadrants actually summarizes or nicely put together the definition of what life-threatening condition is, as was as mentioned earlier. So for quadrant one, it describes the condition as for that which premature death is inevitable, but the child, uh, sorry, Life-threatening condition for which curative treatment may be feasible but can fail, which we all know is, for example, cancer. And in the second quadrant, we're talking about life-threatening conditions for which premature death is inevitable, but the child goes through long intensive period of treatment. Uh, an example would be cystic fibrosis. And in the third quadrant, it describes life-threatening condition as progressive that may last over many years, and the treatment is exclusively palliative. And for example, uh, for example, like neurodegenerative disorders or metabolic conditions. And lastly, quadrant four is an irreversible. Quadrant four conditions are irreversible but non-progressive because so most of the time the child has severe disability and they may experience health complications from their disability that lead to premature death. And in this case, one example would be like severe cerebral palsy. So what happens to a family when a child is diagnosed with a life-threatening condition? So each family's experience is unique and devastating in its own way because life-threatening condition can affect the child in many aspects of their lives, such as it interferes with their daily lives through frequent hospitalization, Parents, ex parents and siblings experience emotional distress, um, such as witnessing like physical deterioration in the ill child, and they experience emotional um, uh, and they experience disruption in their normal activities at home, and they realize that they spend more time and efforts uh, on providing medical care to the ill child. So in particular, parents may feel overwhelmed with learning how to care for and live with, live with the ill child, potentially feeling burnt out in, the pro in providing round-the-clock care. Parents' attention placed on the caring for the ill child may actually reduce their attention and focus and time available for the healthy siblings. So as such, siblings are often known as the forgotten mourners in these families of children with life-threatening conditions. So based on an initial review of the literature about siblings, we found that there were different types of psychosocial outcomes examined. For example, behavioral outcomes, psychosocial outcomes, and emotional outcomes. These findings that we, we saw were pretty mixed, where some studies suggest siblings actually have some positive psychosocial, psychological outcomes, example, enhanced maturity, empathy, and developing leadership skills. But other studies indicate siblings develop difficulties, and some of these difficulties actually persist into adulthood.
So some of the issues that with the research we found during our initial review included behavioral outcomes were usually reported by parents and sometimes teachers rather than siblings themselves. And two, different study designs actually yield different results. So for example, qualitative resu quantitative results generally report siblings having not much difference in problems compared to siblings of healthy children. But qualitative studies tend to indicate that siblings experience significant distress as the illness progress. So to date, research and clinical focus on children with life-threatening condition has primarily been on parents and ill child, as what we can see in this diagram here, where the focus has mostly been on the, where the circle of the parents and the ill child tends to be a bit bigger. But when we talk about families of children with life-threatening condition, we're also talking about the siblings who are part, who are an integral part of the family unit. But yet they still receive so little attention, or rather they receive little attention from clinicians and researchers. However, the good thing is siblings research has gradually increased in the last few years, uh, but there is still room for improvement on the types of research methods used to understand the psychosocial outcomes in these siblings. So given some of the issues that we were noticing in our initial review of the sibling literature, we decided to proceed with a more comprehensive review, which mainly is called scoping review. We chose to do a scoping review over here rather than a systematic review or other forms of review in order to scope out the breadth and the depth of the, of the sibling literature rather, to, rather than trying to answer a very specific question where it's possible that we would not be able to find enough resources or enough research to answer the specific question, given that we already know there's very limited research in siblings of children with life-threatening conditions. So the scoping review was guided by the following question. What are the self-reported experiences of siblings living with a child with a life-threatening condition? So at the initial stage, the title abstract stage, we excluded papers that were not in English. We excluded conferences abstract, para, uh, papers that focus on adult patients who are ages 20 and above, focused on siblings of healthy children, and focused on sudden deaths, like sudden infant deaths, accidents, suicide, and homicide cases. But we included articles that reported on siblings' self-reported experience. And results that were specific to siblings of children with life-threatening condition. So some papers actually reported siblings with uh, siblings of children with sudden deaths and life-threatening conditions. So we only included papers where we can extract information particular pertaining to life-threatening conditions. And second, some of the papers reported both siblings' perspectives and parents' perspective. So in this case, because we are looking only at sibling self-reported experience, we only extracted, we only selected papers where they talked about siblings, uh, where siblings' experience can be extracted out from the paper. So because this is a scoping review, it, it, it requires iterative processes between the reviewers. Uh, so at the second stage, after the initial full, full text stage, we completed a second stage review to tighten the criteria to identify papers that were really relevant to our question. So at stage two, we excluded papers that reported on siblings grief, that reported on interventions program only, and bereaved siblings because bereavement experience is quite different and has a separate literature that focuses on experience after death. So, what we have found is we have identified um, 34 articles that met our inclusion and exclusion criteria. Over here, we can see that 53% were qualitative papers, 88% uses cross-sectional studies, study designs, and 70% focused on siblings of children with cancer. And to date, most of the studies were conducted either in uh, were conducted in the United States, and only two of the 34 studies were conducted in Canada. So I've included a chart from a Canadian study here on the right, which showed that approximately 35% of children receiving pediatric palliative care are diagnosed with cancer, and the remaining are diagnosed with other forms of life-threatening conditions, such as chromosomal, uh, central nervous system, or metabolic conditions. So more than 50% of this child, more than 50% of children have some form of life-threatening conditions that are not cancer, yet. Cancer-related research represents 70% of the 34 studies. So other than the, uh, 
those are the study characteristics which we have found. And the, we have identified four thematic findings from the siblings literature, namely family functioning, social well-being, and psycho psychological well-being, and coping. And I will elaborate these findings in the next couple of slides, in the next few slides. Oh, uh, this one? Yeah. yeah, it's so cute. <laughs> oh, it's a, that's a very good question. It was a picture that I uh, got from, what is that? Is it the BC? I want to say the, oh, I forgot the name. <laughs> it just slipped. Yeah, I got it online, but it was from a palliative group in, uh, in B uh, British Columbia. Yeah, I thought it was really cute. So it represents kind of like the family unit and ah, that's what I, so um, across the 34 studies, siblings reported uh, to be affected by disruption, by the disruption in family routine. So for one, siblings reported lesser amount of time spent on family activities, given that the time together was spent either at hospitals or at home. And two, changes in household routines such as scheduled dinner, time, or after-school activities were modified to actually meet the needs of the ill child. And three, living with, child, living with a child with life-threatening condition changes this routine, which meant that siblings had to constantly learn either new routines or adapt to continually changing routine to meet the needs of the child. And for that, struggling to learn new family routine was repeatedly brought up by siblings themselves. So naturally, these changes led to siblings reporting, reporting a continuous sense of loss. So siblings, relationships within the family also changes. As I mentioned earlier, within a family, we're talking about the ill child, the parents, and the siblings. So the relationship between parents and siblings uh, changes over the course of the illness. For example, siblings reported that they felt neglected and overlooked because significant amount of time is spent on caring for the ill child. Parents, siblings also reported parents being biased at certain times where they were overindulged or overprotective of the ill child. Um, what, two of the common codes that siblings actually brought up were like inequality and unfair treatment. So some of the siblings reported that they understand and are aware of the needs of the ill child that they need the ill child needed more attention but at the same time siblings themselves also reported that they wanted more attention from parents more uh, they wanted attention parents attention and affection as well and lastly siblings reported parents behavior changes in parents behavior as well where mothers are more tend to be more emotional and fathers tend to pro, uh, show more short temp uh, tend to exhibit more um, short uh, emotion, uh, short temper um, characteristics. And the relationship between siblings and the ill child changes over time. And it's interesting because uh, in this case, si the, the experience that siblings actually report are quite extreme because for, for example, one, they, ex they, they report that they experience like a loss of playmate as the ill child's condition deteriorate. They experience a sense of anger, frustration, and resentment towards the ill child uh, for disrupting the lives and the opportunities that siblings can have at school and at home. And they, rep but on the other hand, some siblings report a closer bond with the ill child and wanting, and want to journey through this difficult time with the ill child as best as they can. And we also found that a small group of siblings actually reported feeling indifferent about their Ill, Ill child's condition. So some of these relationships were reported to improve with time, where they learned to adapt the new way of living, but other families who were attempting to work through these difficult challenges reported either no change or becoming worse. So just kind of cover a little bit but um, so the last aspect of the family functioning is changes in the family environment so familiarity is an important um, stable factor in the development of a child as it provides opportunity for the child to develop independence in a safe and protected environment so changes in family environment emerged which resonates with the notion that familiarity is an important stable factor in the child in in the child stable factor that a child needs, in this case, the siblings needs. 
So we, fo uh, we found the following reported by sibling that frequent hospitalization um, resulted in families not being able to be together where they hire like babies, uh, babysitter or nanny and that created a social unfamiliarity for siblings. Siblings also spent more time in unfamiliar environments like clinics, hospitals, or sometimes they have to spend overnight at fam families or like relatives, uh, friends or relatives house. And lastly, it coming home to an empty house. This was more common for older siblings or like teenagers where they found themselves coming home to an empty home where when parents are away with the ill child either at a hospital or like at the treatment center. And this changes their social and physical environment. And it was difficult for siblings as they report feeling more lonely and isolated. So after looking at the family function, we looked at another common theme that was brought up was the psychological well-being. And among all the wide range of emotions that were found in the sibling literature, for example, to name a few like fear, sadness, anger, most commonly reported in both qualitative and quantitative studies were anxiety. So what have we actually drawn out from articles about that reported on anxiety in siblings? For, for one, it usually report it. Anxiety is usually reported closer to time of diagnosis. Sisters reported higher level of anxiety than boys in general. So studies that actually ex examine anxiety in relation to gender found that sisters have higher level of anxiety um, compared to younger uh, compared to brothers. But this relationship between um, anxiety and gender is actually was found to be affected by other factors such as self control. So sibling sisters who who had higher self-control also reported lower level of anxiety. So it's interesting because we would generally observe a consistent relationship between uh, gender and anxiety, but in this case, it's not always the case as we see over here. Adolescents showed more anxiety than younger siblings. So this relationship between age and anxiety is fairly consistent across all the literature. So adolescents are at a developmental stage where they are trying to develop their own identity in which parental support is important at this point, but given the family situation, it reduces the parents' time and resource availability for this adolescence, which potentially explains the higher level of anxiety in adolescence. And uh, lastly, in qualitative findings, when siblings actually mentioned the word anxiety, it was described in the context of lack of information about the illness and when they talk about the possibility of death of the ill child. So the other psychological well-being that was pulled out from the literature was about siblings found themselves to be the family social group in which they're committed to protecting the ill child and their parents by either silencing kind of their own needs or repressing their feelings by not showing that they are upset. They also prioritize the family's needs um, before their own, for example, spending more time at home to help out uh, and care for the ill child. And last but not least, they perceive themselves as the caring one where they take, in more, take on more responsibilities in caring for not only the ill child at home, but also caring for the parents. In this case, kind of sharing responsibilities within at, uh, in the in the home environment. So siblings reported the way of perceiving themselves as social glue allowed them to be confident and independent. These findings actually demonstrated that siblings mature early on due to the circumstance that they experience. So while this may have positive impact on the sibling's psychological well-being, on hindsight, taking, care, taking on caregiving roles and maturing ahead of their peers may or may not be beneficial for healthy siblings. So after looking at the psychological aspect, uh, that si the psychological theme that siblings brought up, the other common theme that was brought up was the social well-being. And at school, they reported uh, siblings reported their experience at school, commonly reported their experience at school. So findings over here were also pretty mixed, where some reported positive support from schools, school teachers and peers, but others, uh, but others reported otherwise. So for example, siblings express fear and reluctance to share information when being asked by teachers or friends because they felt that they didn't have the good, didn't have good knowledge about the ill child's illness. They were equally frustrated at school because teachers or like parents were mainly concerned about the ill child rather than how they felt or how they were doing or si how siblings felt or how siblings were doing. So another common theme, which was quite, uh, I wouldn't say surprising, but I, I, 
it was it was what we pulled out from the the 34 articles was that that bullying and teasing from peers were not were reported by siblings where they felt that friends did not understand what they were going through and were not supportive or nice towards them so another important finding that surfaced was the lack of timely support and interventions from teachers. So siblings support reported the lack of support from teachers when such situation arise. And in this case, perhaps teachers were unsure how to appropriately deal with such situations or fear of discussing sensitive topics about the ill child with the healthy siblings. So the last bit that the last piece of social well-being that uh, siblings reported was about the living in the community. So at the broader, broader social level, siblings reported similar findings where they felt isolated and where family friends were and the extended community asked only about the ill child. So for one, similar, similar to the findings about their experience at school, they felt that no one really cared about how they feel, how they were, and which made them feel isolated, neglected, and sometimes uncared for. So while most people experience like concern, uh, express concerns, some siblings were baffled by the actions that others were try, uh, that the the broader community showed, such as um, uh, kind of uh, by the actions of others that did not show acceptance or intolerance towards the ill child, such as like staring awkwardly at the ill child or um, avoiding sharing the same space with the with the family. So learning how to manage such, such situations concurrently can be overwhelming for the ill child. And thirdly, while siblings actually mentioned that they were aware of the family situation and they are willing to sacrifice time on their social life and spend time with the ill child, they also mentioned that they wanted to have more time and interaction and play, wanted to have more interaction and play time with their peers and friends in the community. So such contrasting findings that siblings report can be difficult as they may not fully understand why and how people behave in a certain way towards them and all of which may influence how siblings adjust during this process. So the last theme that we have uh, pulled out from the study is the coping in healthy siblings. So siblings adopt a variety of coping strategies and, we broadly and was broadly classified into cognitive and behavior coping. So some of the actions that were categorized in cognitive coping were thought stopping, denial, um, and wishful thinking. So example of wishful thinking is that they are hoping that the, the, health, the ill child would get better. Uh, the other form of uh, coping that siblings adopt is behavioral coping. And um, in this case, some of the behavioral copings were engaging in self-soothing activities, participating in group activities, and timeout. So developmental researchers actually attempted to identify what are the different groups of coping strategies that siblings use. So knowing the co group of coping strategies can actually help parents to parents and health professionals to either reinforce positive coping strategies or improve certain kind of strategies that siblings are uh, are using at the moment. So but as of now, cognitive and co cognitive and behavior coping has been cognitive and behavior coping has been the two broad strategies that were examined. But how effective this group of strategies were in helping siblings cope need to be need to be uh, explored and determined. So thought stopping is like when they think about um, they are Ill, the ill child's condition and they think about how bad it could be instead of progressively going down that line they will stop themselves and divert their attention to something else so they block that thought about how siblings how their ill child can get worse and focus on something else instead so yeah that's what thought stopping is <laughs> okay so so as we can see, the four broad themes that I've discussed earlier, which is family functioning and um, the psychological well-being, uh, psychological and social well-being, and the coping of siblings, the scoping review results actually showed that siblings, uh, uh, that cho siblings, children with can uh, showed that siblings actually experience a variety of like difficulties, and at the same time, they also develop positive attributes. So. But the, but the issue is, this, most of these results have been focused on children with, uh, children with cancer and their healthy siblings. When we saw in the earlier slide that only 30, one third of the children with life-threatening condition are diagnosed with cancer and the rest are, have other forms of life-threatening condition. 
So why am I focusing on quadrant three? So in cancer, in in cancer care for children, the care is often provided by a unified team at a single center or a, or a single site, and parents then benefit from the service that is collectively available at the single at the single site under the banner of cancer care. This may include like mental health services for, for them, family support, camps, communal experiences, which other families encounter in the clinic or in the hospital. So simply having a recognizable condition like cancer, um, which is difficult as it is, may create a framework of social understanding in in when every when all the families are which share a common uh, where families of children share a common diagnosis. But there is a significant number of children who are affected by non-cancer type of diagnosis, as we can see in the slide earlier. But yet they do not receive the same kind of support uh, which families of children with cancer receive. There is no single team or clinic that follow these children. They are often, there is often not no support system for parents or siblings to provide an ongoing and organized care for these families, which result in families feeling highly isolated. As most of these conditions are very rare, some of the families also struggle to explain to others what exactly is going on with their lives. So a particular challenge for families are that these diagnoses are one of a kind, or sometimes even the children lack, there's no diagnosis for the child, there's no diagnosis for the child. So in both cases, family are left without information, and this increases the uncertainty and fear in these families, that they, this uncertainty and fear. So therefore, based on the findings of my scoping review and the current state of knowledge regarding sibling scoping, uh, coping and psychological outcome, my study sets out to answer four main objectives. First is to examine the behavioral adjustment in healthy siblings. Two is to examine the relationship between sibling stressor and behavioral adjustment. Three is to examine the relationship between sibling stress and coping. And four is to, ex to determine, uh, ex assess if the stress adjustment relationship is mediated by coping. So over here, um, I have a hypothesized model. So siblings, as we saw earlier in the in my scoping review, that a lot of times the the siblings self report that families having um, changes within the family seem to affect them in a more significant way. So in my hypothesized model. What I have done is I have collapsed, I've combined all the family related stressors, parents related stressor and the ill child related stressor into, I've, I've looked at them cumulatively as sibling stressor and then looking at its relationships with siblings behavioral adjustment. So um, in this case, I have adopted uh, the Lazarus and Folkman transactional stress and coping model and develop a hypothesized model over here, which incorporates the factor that makes up sibling stressor identified through the search of my literature. And also, previously, my scoping review identified um, two broad types of coping behavior, namely um, cognitive and behavioral coping. But in this case, developmental researchers have actually found out that Cognitive and behavior coping are actually like two sep. They are two broad categories of coping. But whether siblings actually actively or passively engage in those type of coping is yet to be like uncovered in in sibling in in the siblings literature. So what so my study seeks to look at active coping, which combines both cognitive and behavior coping, and looking at sorry active and passive coping, which combines both cognitive and behavior coping res respectively. So in my model, I will also control for um, demographic factors, as we can see in the diagram over here. So to address my research question, I'll be conducting, uh, I, did a con I did a secondary analysis of a subset of data from, from the charting the territory data set study. So the charting the territory study was actually a collaborative study between uh, seven Canadian sites and two American sites where children with a quadrant three condition and their families were recruited. So this was a cohort study where they followed children with progressive metabolic neurological conditions from 2009 to 2012. Um, the data source contains all these demo, uh, demographic information, level family data, couple data, and also the individual respective data that uh, the individual psychological 
psychosocial data that was collected from parents, ill child, and siblings themselves. So my study sample actually consist, consist of 70 siblings between the age of 7 to, seven to 18 years old who participated in the study and are living at home with the ill child, and 58 designated parents um, from 58 families, and lastly, 58 ill children between, the, between ages 0 to 19. So as we have so as seen from my scoping review that I reported 88% were cross-sectional studies. While cross-sectional studies are, provide important findings about the association between uh, different types of stress and siblings' outcome, in this study, I will be looking at data over three time points where, we're gonna, where my study will look at the changes that occur from, from baseline from the time at the start of the study all the way to 12 months. Uh, one year after recruit after being in the study so it really looks at the trajectory of change within the family look at the change of the siblings coping strategies and look at the change in behavior and to also evaluate how this changes the relationship in this changes uh, how this changes influence one another in this study in my study sorry so implications so this study actually is a new approach to examining siblings experience because it uses a family-centered approach um, to examine the relationships among siblings stressor coping and adjustment and it considers coping as a mediator rather than a predictor that we that was shown in my scoping review uh, most of the time siblings uh, pre researchers in um, most of the time the articles in the review mentioned that uh, coping was used as a predictor to determine the behavioral outcome in siblings but in this case i've decided to i've used coping i've decided to examine coping as a mediator mediator as guided by the lazarus and folkman coping theory and the third one is that my study adopts a longitudinal approach to examine the relationships between stress coping and adjustment so understanding siblings behavior change uh, over time can actually help parents and clinicians to anticipate how their behavior trajectories will be like so that they can actually improve existing interventions or inform future interventions to support siblings. And so a very quick summary of what we have covered is that the whole experience having a life-threatening condition can be quite devastating for families and it's also very life-changing. The four themes that we I have broadly mentioned were the fam changes in family function, the psychological well-being, social well-being, and coping of siblings can actually vary during the course of the, the ill child's condition. Behavioral outcomes, as we have seen, was pretty mixed. Some of them did pretty well. Some of them had um, difficulties during the course of their, their brother or sister's um, uh, illness trajectory. And examining the relationship between cumulative stress can uh, the cumulative stress and outcomes can actually help us better understand and explain the way siblings behave. And last but not least, all this information can actually help us to improve current support programs or develop future programs to better support siblings. So, yep, these are my references, and thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's how it works. So. Uh, oh, uh, is oh if uh, so, as me asked me if uh, scoping review is one of the three papers that I will be publishing for uh, as part of my dissertation. Yes, it will be. So it's my very first paper and. Um, uh, well, not my very first paper, but it's the first paper of my dissertation, and I recently, uh, or rather, I submitted it for publication to a journal in June, and I recently got a feedback, and yeah, it's going to move forward, so hopefully, yeah, thank you, so. And the other thing is, it sounds like you've already got your data. So we're, we're hoping next year to have an update with your actual results. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much the timeline I'm on. Um, I've actually spent the whole summer. So actually, if we look back at the objectives. <laughs> so um, 
I am now looking at, I've just completed my first object, my analysis for my first objective, which is to look at the behavioral outcome trajectory. And um, yeah, I'm waiting for a committee meeting to discuss my results. Hopefully things progress. And yes, maybe I'll follow up with <laughs> the findings from my study objectives. So yeah, so I, I'm doing that. Uh, I've just completed my first objective analysis, and then I'm going to move on to the remaining one in the couple next couple of months. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So, um, so uh, I had. Um, let me pull this up. So you mean in this model that I've considered uh, age and sex? So I've con uh, yeah. So the question was, have I con I've con since I've considered age and sex, have I also considered birth order and um, how many siblings? Yeah. So in this in this case, because based on the literature that what we have identified, it seems like age and sex were the, like the quite a big confounder looking at when examining this relationship, but in the first objective that I, when I'm looking at behavior trajectory, I did look at birth order, but not the number of children, children, because it was not, I mean, it definitely plays an important part in understanding how the number of children in the family can take away parents' attention, but that wasn't, um, uh, that could, that could be a factor that I could be looking at later on, but at this point in time, I've only so far looked at, uh, siblings age sex and um, birth order was used as a as a control for my first looking at their behavioral outcome because um, whether they are older or younger actually depends uh, how do you say whether they are older or younger affects their perception and as I mentioned earlier siblings are put in a situation where they are where they are expected to mature faster. So being older or younger, sometimes even the younger one who mature faster can influence how their behavior outcome is. So that factor, birth order, was used as a control in my trajectory analysis for behavioral outcome, but not in this uh, bigger model itself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't ask a question about sure. the forgotten mourners and potentially also come out of the birds. Okay. Is there any implications in terms of what can be done in terms of practical approaches for, for the forgotten mourners in order to capture that? Oh, okay. So, yeah, so I did, um, I'm just going to pull this slide up. So, in my implication model, like forgotten mourners is kind of like a broad broad term to category uh, to describe what siblings are like in the sense where I've brought you through saying that they felt neglected and isolated so in terms of like the practical impl impl implications is that since now we're trying to bring we're trying to bring out the fact that them being forgotten isolated they're could be more, um, how do you say, there should be more intervention programs or supportive care in place to support siblings uh, during the t during this time. So one of, uh, I think, uh, one of the, uh, one of the points that I've brought up or rather in, I've discussed in my, both in my proposal defense and in my current paper is that uh, to include siblings in family conferences so to talk uh, to include them in um, caring for the ill child. So in this case, where but when you include children in family conferences, there should be another like there should be other kind of child child specialist who is able to um, translate the information at an age appropriate level for the ill for the healthy siblings to understand in order for them to be so called actively part of the care for the ill child or in decision making for the ill child. Do you happen to know who would provide also programs for younger children that are mourning? Would that be organizations like hospices for children that would actually provide these services? Because as it seems, that's not a usual service that's provided by hospice organizations. So, um, so having worked at Emily House, um, there are a couple. So Emily's House is a, a hospice for children, a palliative care so, uh, that we provide palliative care services for children. We do have uh, in-house camps. We do have um, collaborative, collaborative uh, 
programs with I think it's called Cam Ooch. Yeah, so we do have this kind of programs for siblings. So in this case, there is definitely no one significant pro standout program for siblings where parents can go to or like can reach out to. But unless they are part of this whole palliative care service that they are in or they are in a specific um, organization, uh, hospice environment like Emily's house, then they will know about the service. But otherwise, yeah, if parents or families are not uh, connected with any teams or any uh, do not use any of this kind of hospice service. It's hard for siblings to parents or siblings to know about this support programs. Yeah. Oh. And there's very few services that seem to be the case, right? So it's, it's probably also something that the children's hospitals need to consider as a service later on. Oh, yeah. So I think, th yeah, definitely. Um, it's, uh, I'm not sure whether there are at this point in time, but it's definitely something that uh, should be considered by <laughs> the team, medical team that is providing care for this kind of ill children. Well, thank you thank so you. much. It was very interesting and very thoroughly presented, and uh, and we just have a little token of oh. our appreciation. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you.